Hello, I'm Rich, and we are going to be looking at our fundamentals training. I've been doing a STK training now since 2008, and that's why I'm here teaching you right now. So this first lesson that we're going to do, it's uh, we're just going to introduce you into how to make new scenarios in STK. It's very basic. Uh, what you're going to learn in this scenario is I'm simply going to show you how to set up a scenario. Uh, we're going to go in and look at all the windows in STK, and then we're going to understand some common tools. But before I move on in any of this training, I want you to understand there's so much in STK, we're not going to cover every single button in there. But we're using the STK free license, and I'm going to pretty much cover everything that you get for free. System Toolkits provides a physics-based simulation environment for digital mission engineering. Your system and component models can interact in SDK, enabling you to measure their performance in the context of the complete mission. This approach supports collaboration with distributed, multidisciplinary teams across all of your operational domains and life cycle phases. You're going to learn how to set up a new scenario, understand the SDK windows, and understand common tools. One of the things that happens when people first start using SDK is they'll see our instructors when they open up the uh, SDK, the new scenario wizard, they'll see a little section there that allows you to pick a central body. And they're always like, okay, I don't know why I don't have this central body. Well, I'm going to show you how to do this. So make sure you have SDK open and running right now. And once you do, we're going to go up to the view menu and open up the view menu. And you're going to see where it says planetary options. If you don't have this on, in the new scenario wizard, you won't see selections for the new central body. All you have to do is open up the view menu, click planetary options, and now when we start up our scenario and we go into the SDK wizard, you're going to see selections for the planetary options. Now before I get started here, I do want to point out that this is a quick overview of the actual lesson that's in our help. There's no way this is going to cover each and every step, it's just a quick review of what you can expect to see. Otherwise, if you want details, go to the lesson and follow it step by step. We give you all the steps on how to do this stuff. So we're going to create a new scenario in STK. So the first thing you do is you go to the Welcome to STK window here and you click Create a Scenario. When the new scenario wizard opens up, it's pretty simple. We're going to give the scenario a name, so I'm just going to give this scenario a name and call it STK New Scenario. STK New Scenario. There are some rules in here. Case doesn't matter. 64 characters. But other than that, you can put anything in here up to 64 characters, but it has to be one long word. My description is just a way for you to keep notes. You can write a sentence. You can write a paragraph. You can write a book. It's just ASCII text. It's up to you. I'm going to type in this is my first SDK scenario. I'm just going to leave the default start time. And what you can see in here is this start and stop time that you see here is your analysis time. My start time is, this, is today. My analysis, my stop time is 24 hours from today. I'm doing this on Eastern time. My computer set at Eastern time, and what happens here is this is setting it at 1200 local or 1600 UTCG. Think of that as Zulu time. The UTCG is just um, universal time. Um, again, I'll call it Zulu time. There's other choices in here, like if I open up that pull down menu, select start time, and then set to today, that would start my scenario at midnight local time today, or the equivalent Zulu time, which would be 0400. Set to tomorrow would start it at midnight local time tonight or 0400 tomorrow. Select date just opens up a calendar, lets me pick a date. And then finally, the units, the UTCG is the default unit, but these are all the other units that you can use. And if you're in the fortnights, you can even use those. So once I get done here, I have everything ready. I click OK and my scenario is going to fire up. Now, one of the things you need to remember when you're using STK is you need to make sure you save your scenario in a unique folder. 
and you need to make sure that if you're doing anything heavy duty calculation wise it's usually a good idea to save before you do it all computers are different but there's nothing worse than make doing a lot of work in SDK and not saving and then having something happen to your scenario so it's real easy to save in a unique folder if you go up to the toolbar and you click the save icon You'll notice that STK gives you a save as and it's, and it's going to create a folder for you called STK new scenario that has the exact same name as your scenario object. All you have to do is click save. And now it's saving every time you click save, it's saving your scenario in the STK 12 folder. Now we're looking at our STK workspace. We got a lot of information in our help about this, which you can read. So I'm just going to go over all this real quick. One of the things that we're going to look at is menus and tools. If I use the term menu anywhere in the training, the menus are up here at the top. Then we have a bunch of tools in SDK. These can be all set up the way you want them. You can delete tools that you don't use. You can add tools that you need. So for instance, if I go up to the view menu and I go to toolbars, you can see the tools that are already turned on because they have check marks and the tools that aren't on don't have check marks and you can add them or delete them from here. Another way you can do it is come over here to the toolbar area and right click and you can select them here too. That's a faster way to do it. Uh, I have a tendency to like to do things where I only have to click once instead of twice. This is called the insert SDK objects tool. We'll look at this in the second lesson of our training. So I'm going to go ahead and just simply close it. We'll look at it in more detail later on. Over on the left is what's called the object browser. When you start adding objects to SDK, like satellites, ships, aircraft, that kind of thing, it's going to populate the object browser. And it's gonna be in a child-parent relationship. The overall parent of all the objects in SDK are your scenario objects. And then you'll have scenario objects that attach to the uh, scenario object. And then scenario objects can also have attached objects. Again, you're going to have parent-child relationship. We have the 2D graphic window and the 3D graphic window. Note, if I grab the 2D window, I can't get it out of here. It's stuck. Okay, this is called the integrated area. Now you have choices. I can go to either one of these windows. I can right-click on it and I can make them dockable. I can make them floating. If you make them floating, you can move them over to another monitor. You can go up to the Windows menu and you can select Tile vertically, for instance, and that'll put them side by side. You can add multiple 2D and 3D windows by simply going up to the view menu and adding new windows. Or you can duplicate windows that you already have and you might want to do that because you have property settings that you don't want to lose. Let's go ahead and look at the 2D window. So I'm going to go ahead and maximize the window by clicking on this middle icon in the 2D graphic window. And we can take a look see here and see what we got. So if you look inside the window itself, you can modify things in the properties, but right now what I'm looking at here is the whole earth. If you look real close, you can see that I have a separation between direct sun and umbra. If you go up to the toolbar area here, the first icon is your properties. If you click the properties, and we go down to the lighting page, this is what's allowing you to see the daylight and the nighttime, the shading frame. So you can always turn that off if you don't want it on. It's just good situational awareness. I'm going to cancel this. I don't want to make any changes. The grab globe is this hand right here that's shaded. It's already turned on. All that means is that when that's on, you can put your cursor on the 2D graphic window, hold down your left mouse button, and you can pan. The next icon looks like a magnifying glass with a plus sign. That's your zoom in icon. If I click this, I can go down to my map and draw a box. Now, if you look real close, you can see a little plus sign in that box. That's going to recenter my map to that plus sign. And wherever I put that box, it's going to zoom into the extents of the box. So I'll let it go. I'll let my left mouse button go and it zooms in. I can pan. I can further zoom using my scroll wheel. So again, you can zoom in using the zoom in icon, drawing a box, zooming in. You can use your scroll wheel and you can pan. 
to zoom out, you can either scroll out or you can go up here to the magnifying glass with the minus sign and you'll have to click out as many times as you clicked in to get out and see the whole earth again. Snap frame is this camera looking thing here. And what this allows you to do is it allows you to create a view of your 2D graphic window and you can pick the image type that you want to save that picture as. And these come in handy if you want to do things like create PowerPoint presentations, Word documents, and that kind of thing. You can set up a nice little view in your 2D graphic window and you can uh, use it outside of SDK. The next icon that's called Snap Properties, what this allows you to do is it allows you to say, hey, every time I take a picture inside my 2D window, this is the format that I want to use. Next, we have the measuring tool. It looks like a yardstick with an A and a B on it. If I click the measure tool here, I can, I'll can. i just like use the center of Australia to the center of the United States. If I hold down my left mouse button and drag a line up to the center of the continental US and let it go, if I go down here to the bottom of SDK, if you look way down here in the bottom, you're going to see it says distance from, and then it's going to tell me the lat long that I put my cursor on, and it's going to say two, and it's going to give me another latitude and longitude. And then it'll tell me what the distance is. The default distances in SDK are kilometers. And then it's also going to give me a bearing, and that all comes down to which way that I draw my line. So Message Viewer can give you some good information. Now understand when you measure like that, it's only giving you an estimation of the distance because it's not going to be as precise as if you put two points in SDK using objects, for instance, and then measuring the distance between those objects. This is just a way for you to get a quick idea how far apart places are on your map. The central body icon sort of looks like a blue globe here. If I open this up, I can change my central body into something else. So for instance, like maybe I want to look at the moon. Maybe I want to be Mars. And this comes in handy. We have some advanced tutorials in SDK, such as Astrogator, where we do an orbital transfer between the Earth and Mars. So I have like one 3D graphic window up that shows Earth as a central body. And I have another 3D graphic window up that shows Mars as a central body. So you, like I said, one window can have Earth, one window can have Mars. Make sure if you play with this that you put it back to the central body you're actually using for your analysis. So I'm going to switch it back to the Earth. Now I'm going to zoom back into the map here. And when I do, I'm going to start scrolling down. You're going to see something here. Eventually, as I get closer to the ground, Bing maps are going to kick in. We have multiple maps, and you can see that now, it's starting to kick in. We have multiple maps inside of SDK using Bing Maps. If you go up here to this icon here, this is your Microsoft Bing Maps icon. If you open this up, you can see the aerial is the default. If I select hybrid, it looks like aerial, but now I have names of my roads and towns. I can click road, and this, is, this looks like an old fashioned map but I use it sometimes, it comes in handy. Road dark, I guess some people like this, it's not my thing, I can't, I can't really see it too well. Road gray, eh, I can use that, that's pretty cool. And then finally, the basic bitmap, it really isn't cool at all. In fact, this is what you'll see if you work in a secure environment. So those of you that have those really cool jobs in a skiff, enjoy this view. Next, let's look at the 3D graphic window. The best way to jump between your 2D map and your 3D map is to simply go down here to these tabs. And I'm going to click on the 3D graphic tab. Now, the 3D window is a lot more fun than the 2D window. Doesn't mean you can see more on it. Sometimes, if I want to look at the whole Earth, I actually can use the 2D window better than the 3D window. But if you go to the globe here and you double click on this globe, it's going to give you a latitude and longitude wherever you click. Again, it's only as good as where you click. But situational awareness is the key. 
The next thing, if I hold my left mouse button down, I can move the globe around and look at it from different perspectives. Later on, when we're looking at objects, you'll see that you can do that to objects and it looks neat, especially if you're going to take a picture of it. Now, the reason why this is happening this way, when I turn it, it's turning the whole Earth, is because I'm automatically locked on to the center of the Earth. If I want to zoom in and out, there's a couple ways to do that. I can use my right mouse button. Hold down my right mouse button and push my mouse away from me, it goes out. Pull my mouse towards me, it pulls it in. I can also use my scroll wheel. That works too. Another thing you can do is you can hold down your shift key and you can hold down your left mouse button and you can move things. Now sometimes this comes in handy because I might be zoomed into the earth, but I want to show a satellite out here on this side of the earth. So I just move it out of the way so I can see the view of both objects and, and place it in the middle of both objects. This is just something you're going to have to play with to understand how it works. Uh, some people pick it up a lot faster than others. I'm going to go ahead and go up here and you can see a bunch of tools that look like eyeballs. I'm going to click what's called the home view, the eyeball at the house, and that just recenters my view. I've got an animation toolbar right here. If I click this button called start, the earth is going to start to spin underneath me. If I click the double up arrows right here, this is going to increase my time step. If you go all the way down to the lower right hand corner of SDK, you'll see that time step it defaults to 60 seconds. Actually it defaults to 10 seconds, I put it up to 60 seconds. So the faster I go, the faster the earth turns. Now, if I don't want to watch the earth turn underneath me, if I want to stay locked onto a specific spot on the surface, I'm going to go up here and click on the zoom in icon. I'm going to draw a box around the area that I want to look at. And now if I zoom out and I go up and I click the start button, I will turn with the earth as if I'm a geostationary satellite. I'm going to reset by clicking this red reset button in the animation toolbar. And I'm going to start zooming way down close to the ground. And when I do this, as I get closer to the ground, you're going to see a tiling effect. What's happening is Bing Maps are kicking in, but also so is Terrain Server. We stream terrain, but you have to have an internet connection. It's visual terrain. If I hold down my left mouse button and I move my globe, I can see all the pretty mountains out in the distance. Just warm fuzzies for your eyeballs. If you want to pan in the 3D graphic window, you have to do like in the 2D window. You have to come up here to the toolbar, but this time you have to turn on Grab Globe. Go back to your map, hold down your shift key, hold down your left mouse button, and you can pan. If you don't hold down the shift key, you just turn in circles and you get sick to your stomach. Other things we have here in the toolbar, we have the view from two. We're not going to go over this, but what that allows you to do is view from one object to another. The snap frame and snap frame properties work exactly the way in the 2D graphic window. It allows you to take pictures and set it up how you want to see those pictures. The eyeball at the end gives you an orient north, so if you were turning this around and getting sick, if you want to orient your map to the north, just click the eyeball at the end, and now the top of my map is north. If my map is flat and I want to look straight down, I can click orient from top, and it reorients my map so I'm looking straight down to the ground. Again, the home view, the eyeball at the house, takes me back out to this view. I also have a flashlight, so if I go over to the dark side of the Earth, which is not the dark side of the moon like Pink Floyd did, I can go ahead and turn on the flashlight and it gives me this make-believe light on the other side, but it's not analytical light, it's actually still dark. I'm going to turn that off. If I turn the Earth around, I can also use the measure tool. It's different than it was in the 2D window because it also gives me a radius. So I'll turn that on. I can draw a, a line between two points, but there's that radius, gives me a bearing range right there in front of me. When I let it go, it still gives me that information down the lower left-hand corner of SDK and Message Viewer. 
The Windows central body works exactly the same. I can go ahead and click. Well, that was boring. Let me, uh, let me pick Europa. Europa's a little bit better. Let me go back to the Earth. We'll talk about Globe Manager in another lesson, and my big maps work exactly the same in the 3D graphic window as they did in the 2D graphic window. Finally, I have the um, animation toolbar that I was talking about up here. Again, this allows me to start my scenario, to, to play my scenario forward. I can pause. I can reverse my scenario and go backwards. I can do step and reverse. That'll work your scenario in one time, step at a time. Step forward goes one step it forward at a time and the double up and double down arrows allow you to increase and decrease your time step. This window here, the current scenario time tells you what time you're looking at in your scenario. Finally, the timeline view at the bottom of the screen. This is a way for you to manually move through your scenario. If you look down here, I have this thing called the gray pointer. If I put my cursor on it, hold down my left mouse button, I can quickly move to an event in my scenario and we'll look at the timeline view in more detail in later tutorials. So this was a real quick introduction to STK, how to set up a quick scenario and some of the basic tools that you're going to use a lot when you're using STK. Again, make sure that if you want to see the detail, you go back to the tutorial in STK and you follow the step by step instructions. So our Training today, I introduced you to the uh, new scenario wizard on how to uh, create a scenario. Then we went into STK. I showed you how to save a scenario. We looked at all the windows in STK, such as the 2D graphics window, the 3D graphics window. Uh, what was important about those two windows is each window had its own set of tools. We looked at some of the other tools in the toolbar in STK, and we also introduced you to the timeline view. So with that, I hope you have a nice day and I'll see you in lesson two.